Hey, how's it going, everybody? Sean here for another movie review, and today we're going to be talking about Oliver Stone's 1991 film, The Doors. Uh, it's written by Randall Jan Jansen and Oliver Stone. It stars Val Kilmer, Meg Ryan, Kyle MacLachlan, Frank Whaley, Kevin Dillon, Michael Wincott, Michael Madsen, Josh Evans, Dennis Berkeley, Billy Idol, Kathleen Quinlan, uh, John Densmore, and others. The plot synopsis is the story of the famous and influential 1960s rock band The Doors and its lead singer and composer Jim Morrison from his days as a UCLA film student in Los Angeles to his untimely death in Paris, France at age 27 in 1971. So yeah, I have some uh, personal history with this, uh, but before that, this is not... Not necessarily a request, but uh, this is for Maverick. So thanks a lot, buddy. We were talking about it during a live stream um, last week, and uh, it made me want to revisit the movie, recheck it out, rekindle, light my fire, if you will, um, about kind of my affinity for The Doors. When I was growing up, I was a big, big fan of The Doors. Um, more specifically, probably Jim Morrison, and even so much so that like when I started the band, um, even like on a subconscious level, I kind of emulated a lot of the stage antics and whatnot of Jim Morrison. Uh, it's just something that was kind of just inside of me. Because when I thought of the like the, what, the typification, the, the meta representation of what a rock star was, my mind would go to Jim Morrison. Um, and even the sound of what the kind of music that I like and have liked since then probably inspired heavily by the doors kind of this prog rock kind of bluesy vibe that they had um you know i liked it so them so much or like jim morrison so much you know i re uh, read the biography no no one here gets out alive that's what it is no one here gets out alive um i used to buy and seek out every kind of documentary i remember when in the early days of youtube you know constantly searching and looking for looking for concert footage and interviews and all sorts of stuff, you know, cause it's just at the time when the doors were around from 1965 to 1971, shockingly short, honestly, um, there wasn't a lot of interviews and stuff. There's a lot of written stuff, but you know, Jim Morrison was such a vagabond, such a wastrel kind of <laughs> that he didn't make himself very available. And when he did, he was not particularly honest. Like, even though I think part of his kind of spirit and oeuvre of, as a as a person and as a performer was kind of couched in this the concept of excess and kind of wild abandon, um, he did have a kind of a self awareness about who he was in the public eye and who he wanted to represent himself as. So there's a lot of like kind of mixing of myth and reality and there's esoteric stuff. And, you know, he saw himself as a poet, as an artist, and that's kind of what he wanted to put out to the world. And so it's interesting, you know, when Oliver Stone comes to make this movie in the 90s in the early or the late 80s, early 90s, being such a fan of Jim Morrison, I think he tries to serve that legacy. That's what he's really going for, because I would say the movie The Doors which is kind of weird that it's called The Doors, honestly. It's really more about Jim Morrison. But I suppose that it's you know part and parcel with the reality. The Doors kind of were Jim Morrison. He was the attraction. He was what drove the band. Both in the public eye, both from like a kind of creative aspect, I suppose. Um, and uh, I don't really... So like calling it The Doors is a little bit of a misnomer, in my opinion. But what, he, what Stone is going for is not reality. He's going for myth he's mythologizing the character of jim morrison and what his art represented to people it doesn't really get so much into the reality of it i mean i know that there's like you know all the major beats that you would find in a biopic and it does go um over things that happened and it does happen kind of a linear sequential fashion but it's all kind of inside of this this like kind of uh, the cinematography even kind of reinforces this idea. It's all like very dreamlike. There's a lot of like ponderous sections of the movie. Um, it's even has this kind of meta quality to it. Whereas, whereas like the score of the movie is largely, except for a few instances, uh, door songs. 
even before the Doors are a band, there's Doors songs. Um, you know, you'll hear them just in the bar in the background. You'll hear them at parties in the background before those songs would have been written. So it's kind of all of this idea that, you know, kind of art reflecting life, life reflecting art. But it's there to kind of put you, you're in the Doors world. You're in Jim Morrison's world, his mind, his perception of his life, rather than, I think, a more objective view. And I think it gives the, the film a very unique quality. That's something that's unique amongst kind of biopics of musicians and whatnot. A lot of times they're a little rote because a lot of these journeys, especially people who die very young, uh, hit a lot of the same beats because so much of it is born out of their immaturity and their, and their kind of lack of perspective um, and getting too famous too fast and getting wrapped up in drug culture and, and uh, the kind of movements of the time, you know, the pseudo spirituality was kind of like people out there looking for secular religion. In a sense, right, because if you think about like, you know, the 60s and the love era, whatever it's called, you can think about it as people trying to rebel and break away from like kind of constructs and and formality. They wanted to kind of get more hedonistic, more primal. But still, people want bonding agents. They want something else to look for, look towards to <laughs> look towards to. That's an awful sentence. It's something to look towards, something to aspire to. Uh, so somebody like Jim Morrison, he's constantly, you know, invoking Native American type of feelings and iconography, the shaman, the spirits. And this movie, you know, there's several times where you're just kind of completely in a fantasy dream sequence that kind of mixes the real stuff with Native Americans, like ghostly Native Americans dancing on stage with Jim Morrison, uh, because that's the way kind of Stone sees him. He sees him as kind of a soothsayer, a prophet to a certain degree. Um, I don't know if I feel that way about Jim Morrison, honestly, especially the older I've gotten the more you kind of realize that like he just burned really bright um, and burned out really fast. And a lot of his worldview probably comes from like things he had read up to the time he was like 20. You know, he's, he is Jim Morrison was not a stupid person. He was very well read, interested in a lot of kind of esoteric ideas. And he kind of was able to mill meld all that stuff together. Uh, to create his poetry, to create his art, his persona. And, um, but I, I think it, it limited his ability to really see through stuff. That's why, you know, as the doors in their career, if you listen to their albums, they get more and more kind of, uh, poppy. There's even a section of the movie where you're, you're actually seeing a critic that was like at one of their shows and he, he has a recorder and he's basically just reading a review of the concert. And uh, you get to hear that a little bit about where people were thinking. Cause there was something lost, I suppose in when they decided to do more, what felt like more mainstream stuff. I suppose you you can, you can, you can th think about Morrison's contributions and his, his, uh, his lyrics as being something that kind of elevated the material. But, you know, even at the time, People were kind of just like, no, nah, well, you know, it's not as bluesy. It's not as rough. You know, I'm talking more about the soft parade. And granted, they kind of get their juice back when they get into uh, Morrison Hotel, which I believe was their, I believe was their last album, um, which they kind of go back and they're, they're doing, they're doing like more uh, bluesy specifically stuff, more that kind of rock blues, the stuff that started their career, the stuff that kind of vaulted them into international fame. Um, but yeah, it's, I think it's, it's just this, this, uh, a lot of immaturity in Jim Morrison and he was kind of out of his fucking mind. Honestly, Jim Morrison does not ever come off like a good guy, um, which I, I appreciate about the movie that it kind of just shows him for what he is, even though the movie has a skewed perspective of him, even though the movie is kind of probably more or less what you would imagine Jim Morrison would want you to know about him it's still kind of, it can't get away from the fact that his actions were so erratic and so over the top and, and so kind of um, aggressive and violent and vile. You know, he treated people like dog shit, especially his girlfriend. 
completely treated her like dog shit. And she was just so young and so enamored with who he was or who he sold himself as that she kind of just rationalized and made excuses for uh, his behavior. You know, because she was with him for a long time. And uh, and the movie doesn't shy away from that. So I got to give respect to that. You know, when I saw this back when I was a kid, being a big Doors fan, knowing a lot about Jim Morrison, like I said, I read that biography when I was a teenager. You know, I came to this much later, probably the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, before I ended up seeing it. And I remember not loving it. I remember not not really loving it. I think I had expectations of what I thought like the story should be and you know you get kind of picky when you've especially if you've read that biography there's so many things that get left out. And now that I'm older and I come back to it and I haven't seen it in god probably like 14 15 years. It's like a movie I watched a bunch when I was a, a late teenager and then never revisited. Uh, because even being a huge Doors fan, always loving the Doors, like my my connection and my affinity to them kind of dissipated over the years. Although I got to tell you, watching this movie and coming back to it after all this time, it definitely kind of reinvigorated my my fandom, my passion for the Doors. <laughs> uh, but let's talk about some particulars. So I think the best part of the movie is Val Kilmer's performance. Uh, It is electric. It is enigmatic. He really, really feels like Jim Morrison. He really feels like he got lost in the role. It is probably the performance of his career, honestly. Uh, There is something really special about it. So He's so good, and he looks so much like Jim Morrison and sounds like Jim Morrison and and all that stuff that uh, everybody else in the movie suffers by comparison, especially the other people in the doors like Kyle MacLachlan as Ray Mansurik sticks out a lot to me because they are like people playing dress up. They're like Halloween. It's like Halloween for them. And I do think in some respects that that does doesn't hurt the movie because it's not the focus of the movie. Um, and I think it adds this extra kind of meta layer to it where Jim Morrison is the realest thing. He's the realest part of the movie and everything else around him is just a game. They're all slaves. You're all fucking slaves, right? Like, so it adds this extra kind of texture and quality to the movie um, relative to what I think Stone is trying to accomplish here. Like, this is a movie. This is not... A documentary. It's not like a traditional biopic. It is a movie that has a lot of its own, um, I think, artistic merit and how he wants to present the situations and how it kind of is this grand homage to the concept of Jim Morrison, the concept of the doors. And this is something that a lot of the people involved with it, like Ray Manzrick, especially, like really dislikes this movie. He. You know, because he wanted like the the kind of he wanted Bohemian Rhapsody. If you've seen the film Bohemian Rhapsody that came out a few years ago, Rami Malek won the Academy Award um, for it. That movie is very like a by the numbers biopic, straightforward. Everybody in the band looks great. You know, sure there were some problems here and there, but they kind of just brush over them very quickly to give you kind of this populist, fun, entertaining movie. Uh, well, that's what they were aiming for. I didn't particularly care for Bohemian Rhapsody, but it's a very shallow movie. Very shallow movie. I, I don't understand like how it took the zeitgeist the way it did, but I don't know. That's just my opinion. Um, yeah, so I, I would think that the other the people that were actually there, the people that were involved in Morrison's life, were kind of taken aback to see it represented this way uh, because so much of it is the focus of Morrison's persona. And part of his persona, and he talks about in the movie, he's like he believes in excess, right? And and that's going to bring with it a lot of chaos and a lot of drama and a lot of crazy shit. And uh, the movie, that is kind of the spirit of the movie. wants to to feel the chaos of the artist, the chaos of the truth seeker, right? That's what Stone is trying to imply to us. Um. Um, it's really got an interesting look. The cinematography of the movie is by Robert Richardson. 
who I'm not sure what else he's done. Let's check it out. He's done some good stuff. Glorious Bastards. Oh, he's worked with Tarantino, The Aviator, Kill Bill. Did he do any other stuff? He did Wall Street, Talk Radio, Born on the Fourth of July, The Doors, JFK. Yeah, he's a really, really got an impressive kind of lineup here. Shutter Island, The Good Shepherd, Shine a Light. Wow, cool. He did Venom, Let There Be Carnage. <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, so he's a working, a working dude. But uh, he brings a real life to this thing. Um, and like I said earlier, it's kind of a lot of it feels very kind of esoteric and dreamlike. And even like kind of there's like a there's like kind of this shine or this glow filter over everything. It just tells you right from the beginning, like we are experiencing a dream. We're experiencing something that is not quite reality. And it gives the movie its own kind of a sense of life, you know. It really does stand apart. I got to give it a lot of credit. It stands apart from the usual humdrum of what something like this could have been. Because this could have been just by the numbers, this tragic story of self-destruction and uh, personal failure. But it kind of tries to elevate itself beyond that. Now, I'm not going to suggest that it works entirely. I don't. Because I do think it is at odds with itself because of who Jim Mor- what Jim Morrison would do. And the movie has to show some of that stuff. Like, you know, if you lock your girlfriend in a closet while she's high on fucking hash and set the door on fire, hard to gain my sympathy, you know? <laughs> hard for me to be empathetic to you. But be like, hey, man, that's part of the artist's journey. It's part of, the part of the way he was. And I understand that to a certain extent. But um, because at the end of the movie, the point is lionization. It's about mythologizing. Like, it's like... If you made a movie about Kurt Cobain, which like I guess there is kind of a movie about Kurt Cobain, Gus Van Sant's Last Days, but if you made a movie about Kurt Cobain and and kind of just constantly made excuses for the person that he became, granted, like I said, I do think a lot of these rock stars of that of the sixties, seventies, eighties, nineties are it, it was less of a business per se. It's it is more like people more responded to like your just your magnetism, your hedonism in a way that was very different. People connected with this kind of music in a very different way back then. And it's something that I I really don't think exists for the vast majority of bands today and how people experience music. It isn't as there isn't people don't think about music in the same way they used to. Or at least a lot of people don't. I'm sure there are some people, but it's like a it's philosophy. It's like where you would go to find your soul. I think people were much more outwardly like, well, they would much more outwardly kind of acknowledge that fact. And it let them or led them to kind of act in certain behaviors and really, really kind of star worship and all sorts of crazy stuff. And this comes on the heels of the advent of like television. So many things that kind of all these confluences that come together to kind of create the concept of the modern rock star. And I would say that Jim Morrison, other than like, you know, there's other people, but there's like Elvis, you know, and Jim Morrison. Uh, What's her name? Oh, God damn it. Bobby McGee. You know what I'm talking about. (laughs) Uh, Bob Dylan. You know, they were at, they just hit it right at the right moment, you know? One of the craziest things to me, though, like reminded that the movie reminded me of is that this like the entire career of the doors takes place in six years. And even when you're watching the movie, this feels like a fucking lifetime, (laughs) but it's not. It's just a few years. Just a few albums. And what is what is the testament to the enduring? The enduring nature of their music, you know. Is it Jim Morrison? Is he the thing that kind of kept it in the zeitgeist for way after his death? Probably is. Honestly, it probably is. Yeah, it's going to be, it's, it's crazy because I was just like, I was watching the movie and I was, and I was, then I, after the movie, I was kind of uh, just doing some house chores and stuff. And I immediately, I just like put on the doors, put on like the greatest hits of the doors. Um, and really, really kind of took me back down memory lane. I hadn't thought about this stuff in so long. Especially in my own, like, terms of my own life and where my life went in my early 20s. 
and what my aspirations were and how much of that stuff and my behavior uh, probably was subconsciously influenced by the doors, specifically Jim Morrison. Yeah. Well, if you haven't seen this in a long time, I think it's worth a revisit. Honestly, uh, it's a much more interesting movie probably now than when it came out. When it came out, it might may have been even a little too close to his death. But with every passing year, you have when people die, you know, their kind of legend changes and, and develops in different ways in terms of how culture interacts with it. And I think at this point in history, Jim Morrison is somebody that you can kind of look back at more as a mythological figure. So the movie makes more sense that way, right? And also, it's you know, it's removed from all the kind of the bad press of, around the movie and the fact that the band didn't like the movie and and uh, and that some of the people involved in Jim Morrison's life, there's tons of stories and stuff, which is, it became a thing for Stone for a while because after this, he does JFK, I think. And that was another movie that got really eviscerated by uh, the intelligentsia of the time. Because uh, this was not, I don't think this was a, like a uh, ubiquitously like a loved movie. There's probably some people that could get on the on the wavelength of it, but this is something that has plagued all of Stone's kind of bio, like kind of biopics. Nixon was another one. People get really hung up on the details, and if you are that kind of person that's like you know so familiar with the history of the Doors and and knows everything about Jim Morrison, kind of like I was when I first saw the movie, I think. It's a harder watch. But having been just removed from all that stuff, I, I really loved the movie. I really I really enjoyed it. And I'm glad that uh, we were talking about it the other day, Maverick, and I'm glad that I finally sat down and actually had like a good, thorough watch of it. It had been such a long time, you know? And, uh, yeah. But, yeah, good stuff. Val Kilmer rules. <laughs> he rocks, man. One of the things I love about the movie, too, is that it... it uh, it uses, and this is such a smart thing, it uses both Val Kilmer actually saying this stuff because he could do a really good impersonation of Jim Morrison, but also blends that together with real, with the real Jim Morrison, with the real audio recordings. And it, and you can't tell, it's seamless, but it adds this, this quality. And it also, again, underlines that meta quality to the movie of this kind of mixing reality with, with the myth. Like mixing Val Kilmer in with real Jim Morrison and back in and out again definitely adds something to the movie. It adds this kind of gives it this this texture, this fucking kind of abstract quality to it that you can't quite put your finger on. You can't really quite put your finger on it. You know, it's interesting. But uh, anyways, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to know more about Zoobox, there's a bunch of links in the description for Facebook, for Instagram, for my Twitter, for Dan's Twitter. Also, if you'd like to make a recommendation for one of these movie reviews, throw it in the comments. I'd love to have some a direction to go in. And uh, thank you, Maverick, for <clears throat> bringing this up the other day. And like you know, just like that, that could be you. You could be recommending something for me to ramble about for 23, 24 minutes. What a world. What a world. All right, everybody. You have the best day ever. Goodbye.